we constructed fake resumes, over 6,000, and one third indicated that the applicant had a spinal cord injury, one third indicated they had Asperger's syndrome, and one third did not disclose a, a disability. And this was in the cover letters, not in the resumes. All the resumes were identical. identical. And do you want to take it? Yeah, so we just wanted to explore uh, whether job applicants with disabilities received fewer expressions of employer interest than those without disabilities. And? And what we found was fairly interesting. 26% um, of people with disabilities, our applicants, received fewer expressions of employer interest than those without disabilities. And our applicants who had high experience were the ones that didn't get a call back. And this was mostly centralized around small size firms. Right. How does this research differ from previous research on disability employment? Well, there have been surveys um, asking employers about their attitudes and behavior towards job applicants and employees with disabilities. But you always have to worry there that something called social desirability uh, bias, where they're telling you what they think you want to hear. And this way, by actually sending out resumes, you eliminate that problem. It's reminiscent of a famous uh, research study done years ago now that uh, with the identical resumes, yes. but one had a black sounding right. name, whatever that yes. means. And, and the result was that those people got fewer callbacks. Exactly, and we used that study as kind of a uh, jumping off place for our study. How does this type of research into discrimination um, uh, get at discrimination in a way that other studies couldn't? Well, in terms of yes. implications, when you look at field experimentation, what we're doing is we're sending out mock applicants into the field, but employers don't know that. So as they're screening through these profiles, they're assuming that um, these are tried and true applicants. Can you extract from this information why? Well, that's really interesting. We could not interview any of the employers, mm -hmm. but we believe that there is still a lot of stigma attached to disability. And what really surprised us, as Mason mentioned, was that the experienced applicants had fewer callbacks than the novice applicants. Now that goes against what we expected because we thought, listen, if you have a CPA, this was for accountant positions, if you have a CPA, you have a stellar record, you have six years of experience, we thought they'd do better. But we think that employers see these candidates as riskier, they'd have to pay them more, and they don't want to take that risk on. They see disability and they think, oh my goodness, they're going to demand an accommodation. There's going to be liability. We're not going to be able to predict how they're going to work. And that's how you think it relates to the, the whole em employment picture for people with disabilities? We think it's a big piece of it. it certainly. Yes. Um, of course, when we, I, when we identified that small size firms amongst our sample size yes. of 6,016 were more likely to not give us a call back, uh, in terms of implications, it may just be that these small size firms don't have a robust HR infrastructure or aren't even familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act, although they're not necessarily mandated by the act. What surprised you the most about this? Well, as far as the story itself and, and really the narration of the data, is, it's two-pronged. On one side, you see that medium and large size firms are, for what it's worth, abiding by the mandate, the ADA. On the flip side, it seems as though that small size firms are, are more likely to commit to legal discrimination. At least that's one implication, right, that we can assume. And uh, as far as implications for the act, well, the act is working, but perhaps we should lower the threshold and include some of those small size firms. Just to, can I just sure. jump in here for a second? Um, so we found there was a big difference between companies with less than 15 employees who are not covered by the ADA and those that were bigger than, had more than 15 employees. Right. And that's where we really saw a large difference. What are the long-term implications of this? How do you make this work the world, if you will? Well, there are several things. As Mason said, one thing would be to expand coverage of the ADA so that you don't have to have that 15 employee threshold in order to be covered by the law. It seems as if perhaps the smaller companies aren't even aware of what they should be doing. They might not know that maybe they have a state law that covers them. They, we don't know. But expanding coverage of the ADA would definitely be a first step. Oh. I, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I think it's also a conversation of diversity, right, yeah. and how diversity matters. And given the climate uh, in terms of just the presidential election coming up and, 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 so on, and whatnot, uh, it, ultimately, 
we need to bring diversity as far as disability diversity to the forefront. And studies of this nature are really going to address something that we have known in the body of literature that is the disability movement. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.